chapter three is grouping notes. And this is perhaps our most fundamental type of structure that we use in scene graphs. This is what makes things work. How do we organize all of these different 3D principles in a sensible way so that we can model what we want to do and the machine can interpret that and produce what we're looking for in a sensible way. Right. I'll pause briefly uh, to also note here that we, we have quotes on each of the uh, screens, uh, each, on the, uh, each of the chapters, and here we talk about working groups. Uh, when we look back at the history and the present and the future of X3D, people ask things like, well, how'd you do that, or why, or what's coming up next? The answer is always very simple. It's no one person who does that. It's actually working groups. People who join Web3D Consortium get together every week or two, usually over the phone, all the time on email, and we work on problems together. And um, that's how it goes. So in fact, I'm, I'm pleased to announce, just as a point of interest, today is the uh, uh, 14th of July. Did I get that right? Bastille Day. It's also the day that we uh, uh, approved the new uh, computer-aided design CAD working group. So this is going to take our CAD component to the uh, second generation of how do we export big, complicated, heavy-duty engineering design models and save sufficient detail that they're viewable and visible and manipulable but get rid of all of the extra stuff that's not needed so that we can unlock some of these assets and put them on the web. That's our CAD group and it's formally approved today. Okay, so what's in this chapter? The usual structure for uh, each of these slide sets, uh, overview, concepts, the things that are common to all the nodes. Then we go node by node. That's what it's all about in X3D. How do we use each node? And then at the end, we look at what other resources might you have available and some suggested exercises. Okay, so for our overview, what the heck are they? Well, here's a listing. Here's a list of the grouping nodes that we care about in X3D, and they're primarily for organization. The group node does nothing else. It simply groups things and say, yeah, these are a bunch of things that go together. And as simple as that is, it's, it's quite useful because it lets us collect, copy, hide, expand things as we need them. The static group is very similar. It just says, not only is this a group of things, but it will not change. It won't animate. It won't be modified so that a browser can optimize its display of those. The transform node is uh, maybe our most common node, certainly it's the workhorse. The transform is where we can translate in XYZ the position of things, where we can rotate about an axis, where we can define a center and make that the center of rotation. We can also scale it, either uniformly or non-uniformly, squish it one way, stretch it another. Finally, we can define bounding boxes in there that are used for collision detection to see whether or not something is being touched. Inline is our first extensibility mechanism. The X in X3D is extensibility. What inline does is it lets us take any other scene that's already been created and just pull that into our own scene, just as if it were a group node that said, reach out and collect that and put it here. So if we have a nice model we want, we can locate it in our scene. We can even use a transform to move it around to where it belongs. Okay. Level of detail, LOD is the abbreviation, is where we can do optimization of how we view things, rendering performance, where we say, well, unless we're up close and personal, maybe we don't need that 100,000 polygon model of the sneaker. Uh, maybe when we're a little farther away, we can use a reduced fidelity model. Maybe when we're really far away, all we need is a, a little box or a cylinder. Maybe when we're even farther away, we don't need to draw it at all. 
So LOD is what lets us scale up to larger and larger scenes by hiding details that are not relevant at a distance. Finally, switch node is a grouping node and it can have multiple children, but the switch says which one is active at a given time so that we can use this as an animation technique. Okay. There's a couple more grouping nodes. We'll see them in the next chapter, chapter four. Okay, so what are the common concepts here? First is the notion of a tree. A tree is a data structure, and that is what our scene graph is all about. It has a root node, and it branches out as we go down parents, children, children of the children, great-grandchildren of those children, and continues on and on. And what we can do is create a hierarchy of relationships between these things. And so we take great advantage of that. Uh, for example, when a transform has multiple children, they're all affected by the translation. If we have another translation under that, it will be further affected, and so on and so on so that we can build these hierarchies of relationships and each one is logically consistent yet located uh, coherently and uh, in a consistent way with the rest of the scene graph. Okay? So these are the terms we'll use throughout the class where each node, each element is uh, one of the primitives or one of the fundamental constructs we do. Uh, if it has a child, then it's a parent. If it has no child, then we would call it a leaf node. If it's somewhere in the middle of the graph, it's a subgraph. Sometimes we might also call those intermediate nodes or internal nodes. Now, there is one important aspect of this. If you've studied uh, tree data structures in mathematics or in computer science, then great. Uh, all of that knowledge is helpful here. One thing that's specific about our trees is that, first of all, it's directed. It has a top, has a bottom. Also, it's acyclic, meaning no cycles, no loops, so that you can't get a graph that is no longer a tree. Okay. Now, as we'll see, there's, a, there's one or two relaxations to that where Yes, it's a literal tree, but some nodes can refer to other nodes, and that's good. So you can get relationships between them. But when push comes to shove, when you look at the structure that's written out, it is directed and acyclic. There is no logical looping in there that could lead to uh, infinite loops or other, other failure modes. Okay. Now, if we take this uh, and say, how does this correspond to XML? we get a great correspondence between what are nodes and attributes, excuse me, what are nodes in X3D and in uh, elements in XML. Similarly, our attributes in XML correspond to what we call fields in X3D. This slide set is review because it's first covered in chapter one and in the chapter one slide sets but we're, we're reiterating it here because this helps you understand how did we structure X3D the way we did. And if you're just coming into X3D with, uh, uh, without prior experience, it hopefully it looks pretty logical. That's how we tried to set it up. If you came at it from Vermal and you're used to a slightly different jargon, I hope it also makes sense because once we establish this basic correspondence, this basic pattern, then we get to take advantage of all of the benefits XML brings. I think the primary one, by far, is the ability to validate, the ability for XML tools to say, hey, you made a mistake and it's right here. In Vermal, because we had a unique syntax with lots of squiggly and square brackets, it was harder for tools to do that. In fact, they had to be virtual reality modeling language, Vermal aware. They had to understand just how that language worked. Here in X3D, we can use any XML tool, and they'll simply look at the top and go, oh, 
XML. Oh, it's not just XML, but it's X3D flavor of XML. And I know either through the document type definition or the schema just what that means, that we can confirm whether or not your scene is structured in an appropriate way. Okay, so our grouping rationale then is that we want to collect nodes together as they make sense and that we can use different coordinate systems if that's a transform that's the grouping node that separates them and then finally we can copy them with def and use. Let me leave you with one thought then on this session and here would be a good exercise for you to do tonight. Why don't you take any X3D scene and check it out. We'll look here in the uh, in the tree view and I think you can see pretty quickly better keep that guy muted here we go see pretty quickly on the left hand side that this is a tree okay maybe it's a mental exercise maybe it's something you print out but get comfortable with the notion of this document which is just a bunch of characters in a row capturing that tree structure on the left. And I think uh, an interesting way to do that is if you take your printed document and turn it sideways to see where the tree structure goes, or simply draw the links in there to say parent, child, parent, child, and then look at that drawing and say, oh, you know what, that really does match what the tool is showing me here. Horizontally or vertically, it doesn't matter. Okay, see you next time.